into our interview series with experts from various academic fields relevant to the war in Ukraine. My name is Jens Hartmann and I'm a research assistant at the Institute of European Eurasian and Russian Studies at Carleton University. I'm working at the War Observatory project for the war in Ukraine, which is hosting this interview series. Today with me is Achim Hurrimann. Achim will give us some insight on how Western Europe is affected by the war in Ukraine and how the perception in Western Europe are like. I would like to go a bit more into detail into specific cases that attracted public interest uh, and are connected to the war in Ukraine. After you just told us that the war is perceptive different in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe and within Western and Eastern Europe is perceptive differently, um, I would like to get a sense of how this different perception affects political decisions. For example, in Western Europe and Germany in particular are often criticized for a um, lot of from a lot of uh, Eastern European states for not providing a not enough military aid uh, to Ukraine. Um, is this criticism justified? It's difficult for me to assess, of course, how much military uh, assistance Germany would be able to provide. Uh, the German government sometimes says that they have essentially already uh, provided everything that they can spare and the rest is needed for uh, German defense purposes. And I don't have any insight in that. But it is clear that Germany was relatively reluctant, uh, at least initially, to provide heavy weaponry to Ukraine, and that it took Germany longer than some other countries uh, to uh, provide that military support. But the Germans did come around and did provide quite substantial assistance to Ukraine. Uh, and again, I think that has to be understood against the background of the previous German policy, which I already talked about, where there was really across the political spectrum, a hope that despite a cooling of the political relationship to Russia, um, strong economic relations could be maintained, and that those strong economic relations and the mutual dependency, especially in the field of energy, would actually be a good thing because it would help uh, to sort of prevent Russia from uh, moving away even further from the West. Now, uh, it, it is really remarkable how Germany shifted quite quickly from that position. Um, but you see still a bit of a remnant of uh, uh, perhaps that, uh, that uh, previous position in a reluctance to actually uh, provide heavy weaponry to Ukraine. And there's a substantial debate within Germany about that. And uh, that has sometimes been criticized from elsewhere. In my personal view, I think it's healthy to have this type of debate. So I wouldn't want to shut down uh, a debate within a democratic country um, about uh, how to respond to a major geopolitical event like this war. So I would, um, I, I, I would not necessarily see that as a problem that there are different positions in the public sphere on whether it is wise to provide um, military assistance or which type of military assistance should be provided and which one sh should not be provided. Um, and, and that is certainly what we've seen in, in Germany with some intellectuals coming forward and warning against uh, the uh, delivery of, of heavy weaponry and so on. But in the end, uh, the German government has been uh, a fairly reliable ally of the West in supporting uh, the uh, military of Ukraine and, uh, um, and uh, uh, providing quite substantial weapons, sometimes through relatively complicated uh, exchange processes with other um, EU member states. Uh, and always trying to be in lockstep with the United States. So we have seen the chancellor um, repeatedly uh, referring to the United States and saying, well, the United States are not yet delivering these types of weapons, so we are reluctant to do it as well. Um, that came across as, uh, as being sort of uh, putting the, the foot on the brake and, and being skeptical of uh, supporting Ukraine. But in the end, if you, if you look at the amounts of weaponry and financial support and so on provided from, from Germany, Germany is one of the largest uh, contributors to supporting the, the Ukrainian army. So um, obviously, uh, this is, uh, again, because Germany is so much more exposed 
uh, a relevant political debate. And uh, I also want to remind everyone watching uh, this in Canada that uh, when Vladimir Putin threatens to use nuclear weapons, that might be scary from our perspective here, but it's significantly more scary if you are in Europe and much closer. And, uh, and therefore, I, I wouldn't blame uh, anyone who, who uh, is asking the question in Germany, um, is it wise to, uh, to provide weaponry? Could it, could it lead to a, a, a kind of military response that we don't want to see? I don't want to uh, endorse that position, but I do think it's a plausible question to ask, and I wouldn't want to dismiss or, or, um, or uh, to harshly criticize people who are asking, which I think is a, is a legitimate question. Okay, thank you very much for giving us, us this uh, interview, uh, overview on the military and security uh, defense field and the debate around it. But let's address another political topic that attracted public interest uh, also. Um, also in the public debate, there has been these questions around the nuclear power use in Germany and Germany's withdrawal from the use of the nuclear power plants. Can you explain why this topic became relevant again after the war in Ukraine was started? And can you give us some insight on this, on how is this discussed in the German society? And right. do you think a withdrawal from the withdrawal is possible? Yeah, um, well, uh, it is It is an interesting and relevant debate because as, as we discussed earlier, um, Germany has been heavily dependent, or what used to be heavily dependent on Russian gas. Now gas deliveries from Russia are down to, to zero uh, right now. Um, and Germany is trying uh, to replace this uh, gas by making agreements with uh, other um, countries that might deliver gas, often in the form of uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, um, and uh, that requires building up an infrastructure for importing it and so on and so forth. Uh, so while the German government has been very active to try to identify new suppliers, um, it's uh, clear uh, that uh, there are reasons to be concerned about the security Security of the of the energy supply over the winter. So the German government has tried to stock up on natural gas, um, but depending on how the winter goes and how harsh it will be, there could be a situation uh, where the gas might uh, become scarce, uh, and that has led to debates about a how we can conserve energy, and b uh, what could be alternative. Uh, uh, sources of energy provision. And obviously in that context, it makes sense um, to see if electricity that is produced from gas could instead be produced from nuclear energy, even though Germany decided a couple of years ago to phase out nuclear energy. And there are currently still some nuclear power plants which are sort of really at the end of their lifetime and were supposed to be shut down, but would still be um, capable at the moment of producing uh, electricity for a little bit longer. So that explains the debate to say, well, maybe we should keep them going just for this winter or a little longer to have a backup um, in case all of the gas is needed for heating, say, and no gas would be available for gas uh, fueled power plants that produce electricity. That is the debate about nuclear energy. Um, for proponents of the phase out of nuclear energy, especially in the German Green Party, um, this would be a very big step because uh, this has been sort of their signature policy really since the 1970s, 1980s to phase out nuclear energy. And uh, if you have argued as a politician for your entire political lifetime that nuclear energy is dangerous and you need to get away from it as quickly as possible, even extending the lifetime of a reactor for half a year is a very significant concession. Um, that's why it's sort of an, an emotionally charged issue. And the uh, Minister for the Economy, who is responsible for this uh, question, or that Habeck, of course, is of the Green Party. So it's a difficult politically fraught issue for him. I do not think that in Germany we will see beyond perhaps extending the lifetime of nuclear power plants for another half year or a year or so. And I don't think we will see 
decision to reverse uh, the phase out of nuclear energy. Um, there seems to be relatively broad societal support for it, despite the fact that very few other European countries have, have actually followed the, the German lead um, in this. Uh, but uh, I think it's rather a debate about sort of uh, keeping uh, the nuclear power plants going for a little bit longer to uh, address potential energy shortages this winter. Of course, in the long term, the question will be um, to find new ways to import natural gas and then beyond that to really replace uh, natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel, even though one that's sort of cleaner than coal and so on, uh, to replace that fossil fuel with renewable energies. And uh, here, Germany did make some progress, but that progress slowed in the last decade or so. Um, and there really needs to be a new push. I think there has been now a new push to uh, invest in uh, renewable energies that can uh, replace both gas and nuclear power in the long run. Okay, thank you again, Achim. I think we have a better understanding now on how complex and this debate is. Um, but for now, let's keep it let's keep it there. Uh, to our audience, I would like to say if you're interested in other topics around the war in Ukraine, feel free to watch some other videos uh, of this interview series. Uh, thanks again, Achim, and goodbye. Thank you.